Welcome to the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, for the talk today. Thanks, Kent. Thanks, everybody, for coming and joining us. The topic today will be low-level viremia and HIV, a topic that perplexes a lot of clinicians, myself included, a topic that's come up a lot in clinic and here on ECHO. That's why I chose this topic, although I will say I feel like I fell a bit down a rabbit hole the deeper I got into this, the more questions that came up and the fewer answers. So what I will present is a little bit about what we know about low-level viremia and HIV, a lot about what we don't know, and then a couple of considerations for evaluation and management. So here's a case, this is someone I saw in my clinic just to get the wheels turning. So this is a 45-year-old gentleman. He had a history of cryptococcal meningitis. He had presented initially with very advanced HIV. Baseline HIV was, RNA was 368,000. He was started on a tripla. This was a couple years ago. By six months, he was undetectable on a tripla and clinically doing much better. And then over the course of about three months, he had these low-level viral loads, 52, 50, sorry, 52, 41, then 86. He reported 100% adherence. He had no resistance on his baseline genome. Pharmacy confirmed he was refilling on time. So here's just a question to think about. What would you do here? Three straight low-level viral loads. Would you push forward, do adherence counseling, follow the viral load, change the regimen, intensify the regimen? Now we have this option of checking a DNA genotype. Would you consider that? So I'll just let you think about that. What I'm going to cover today is this term low-level viremia, and I'm defining that here as a viral load between the level of detection of your assay and 200 copies. It's variably defined in different guidelines and research, and research studies, but this is how I'm going to define it today. I'm going to talk about some definitions, a little bit about the clinical significance, and then just some considerations for evaluating the cause and for management. There is this other term in the literature now called very low-level viremia. These are those cases you get where they are detectable below the limit of quantification, so detectable below 20 or be detectable below 40. For time, I'm going to come back to that at a later date and talk about the, the possible significance of those values. So let's first just talk about some definitions and what is low-level viremia, and I'm going to present some very nice figures from David Spock. These are lovely, as David always creates. So first, let's just talk with talk about virologic suppression. So let's say someone starts ART here with a baseline viral load here. The HHS guidelines define virologic suppression as reaching a RNA below the limit of detection of the assay, and this generally happens by three to six months. They do include a caveat that for people with very high baseline viral loads, it can take longer. So this is the HIV RNA decreasing and by six months becoming ideally undetectable on whichever assay you are using. The guidelines are really vague about whether these detectable below quantification viral loads count. I'll say for, in general, I do count those as virologic suppression, but again, we'll come back and talk more about that at a later date. Now, if you use very sophisticated research assays that go all the way down to single copies, 70 or 80% of people, even with long-term ARVs, ART suppression, do retain some degree of virus in the single copy range, in the one to 10 copy range. So if you read in the literature, that's defined as residual viremia, and the significance of that is really unclear. The cause and significance of that remain unclear. But what happens if somebody gets down to, let's say, undetectable, or gets down to less than 20 or less than 40, and then you get a viral load check that's above that value and that's detectable? I think the right next move is certainly to recheck it. And the worst case scenario is that it continues to rise. And if it reaches above 200 copies, that would now, by current guidelines, be defined as virologic failure. And that definition has evolved over the years. And I just want to make this point that the current HHS guidelines really do define a viral load over 200 as being virologic failure. And they make this point that in contrast to a viral load below 200, Individuals with a viral load above 200 are more likely to, de to develop resistance, especially if the viral load is over 500. So a viral load that increases to over 200, we would count as failure and would attempt resistance testing. And especially if it's over 500, that absolutely is failure and absolutely resistance testing should be done. There's an alternate possibility when somebody is suppressed and then has a rise, and then you recheck it and it comes right back down and continues to be suppressed, and we would call that a blip. And in general, the guidelines in the literature would suggest that infrequent, isolated, low amplitude blips, low amplitude being usually less than 400 or 500, are 
probably not clinically significant and probably should not change management. But what's more perplexing is this situation where somebody suppresses and then they hang out in this kind of 50 to 200 range or maybe whatever the limited detection of your assay is uh, above that but below 200. What do you do about that? We've talked about a number of those cases here on ECHO. I have a handful in my clinic that cause a lot of consternation for both providers, myself included, and for patients. So here's just a summary of those definitions. So we're really going to focus on this today. Low-level viremia between the limit of detection of your assay and 200 copies. This very low-level viremia we'll come back to at a later date. So I think one big question is are these low-level viral loads, these 40 or 50 to 200 viral loads, are they clinically significant? The first part of that question I think is do they indicate a higher risk of virologic failure? And Studies are mixed, results are mixed. I want to show you an example of one study, and this is an example of why there is concern about these viral loads. So this is a study from Montreal, and they looked at individuals who had persistent low-level viremia by various definitions, and I'll show you that on the next table. All of the individuals had that persistent low-level viremia for at least six months, and then they just looked at what is the risk of virologic failure defined as above 1,000 copies. Now, when you look at the literature on low-level low viremia, it's a little challenging because the studies define low-level viremia differently. They define virologic failure differently. But here's one example. And so you can see here the overall risk of virologic failure defined as viral load above 1,000 if a person has a non-detected viral load for six months, if they have a viral load between 50 and 199 for at least six months, and then if they have viral loads in these ranges. And you can see here there's a significant difference, a significant increased risk of virologic failure in those who have viral loads of 50 to 199 compared to those who are completely not detected. So that's why there is this concern. In reviewing the literature, I found a few studies like this that did show higher risk. I would say a lot of them were more modest in the risk they identified than this one, but this is why there is concern. This particular study was a little bit limited in that it was using ARVs. We wouldn't necessarily reach for a first line anymore like a Favarin's and boosted lopinavir. I really couldn't find a good study of low-level viremia in the era since we started broadly using dolutegravir, so I think that's one limitation to the literature. But there are many studies like this that showed that a viral load between 50 and 200 may increase the likelihood of future virologic failure. Now, in terms of is this cl clinically significant, I think the other question to ask is, well, are people with persistent low-low viremia at higher rates of CD4 decline or AIDS events, non-AIDS events like cardiovascular events, or death? And again, the literature is fairly mixed. What I would say is the preponderance of the literature suggests that even people with these low-level viral loads below 200 generally do not experience CD4 count declines and generally do not experience an increased risk of AIDS events. But I'll just show you an example of the conflicting results that are available. These first two studies were both presented at the European AIDS conference this fall. This first one from Italy found that a viral load of 50 to 400, so that's how they defined low-level viremia, does not predict AIDS events, cardiovascular events, or death. Notably in this study, a viral load above 400 did predict those outcomes. However, this other cohort, also from Italy, found that a viral load of 51 to 500 did raise the risk of AIDS events and mortality, although agreed that those low-level viral loads did not increase risk of non-AIDS events. So how do you put those together? I'm not sure. These other cohorts found that low viral loads did not predict non-AIDS events in this Dutch study, and in this very large study did not predict uh, AIDS events or deaths. So my interpretation of this is that the majority of the literature suggests that these low-level viral loads are not particularly clinically significant, but again, I think it's mixed. I think the jury is out, and I think there are a lot of problems with these studies. The other question I, I tried to ask is, well, what about transmission risk in these individuals with persistent viral loads of, say, 100? What do we know about that compared to non-detected viral loads, compared to higher viral loads? And again, I really don't think we know for sure, and I think that's a limitation on how to counsel individuals with these low-level viral loads. And I'd be very curious to hear what you all think and what the panel thinks about these low-level viral loads and how clinically significant they are. 
So I think there I posed more questions than answers. But that is what I found in researching this topic. So more importantly, what do you do with a patient who has a persistent viral load in this range? And I do think I'm talking about persistent viral load. So if somebody has a viral load that's undetectable, comes up to 50 or 60 copies, comes right back down to undetectable, I would call that a blip. I really wouldn't do anything differently if, the, if it's low and it's isolated and it doesn't recur. So this is really, you get a viral load in a low level range, you recheck it and it's persistent over multiple checks. So what are the possible causes and what kinds of things can you do to evaluate it and then some thoughts on management. So I think there are a number of different factors and I've divided these into patient factors, medication factors, virologic factors, and then collection or assay factors. And so in terms of patient factors, I think adherence is always the first consideration and generally the first step is to assess adherence, make sure the person is taking their medications appropriately and taking them 100%. We talk about absorption of medications. I think that is a consideration, though I haven't frequently seen it be an issue. There are food requirements with some of our modern ARVs, and I think asking questions about that and making sure a person is complying with that makes sense. Drug-drug interactions are certainly a consideration. And then the virologic factors. And what's debated most in the literature is these first two. Do these low-level viral loads, whether they are the very low residual viremia or the blips or the low-level viral loads below 200, do these represent simply intermittent activation of latently infected cells, which may not be replication competent, and I'll show you a visual of this on the next slide, or is this ongoing active replication of virus at some undefined sanctuary site in the GI or other lymphoid tissue in the spleen? And I don't think we really know. I think there's conflicting data, and I don't think these are mutually exclusive. I think both of these can be going on in the same patient, and we've seen evidence of that on past echo cases. The other potential viral factor is mutations, such as resistance mutations, or there is data that certain mutations in subtype B HIV may preclude to low-level viremia, or there are studies showing that people with non-B subtype virus are more likely to have low-level viral loads. So those are a slew of virologic factors that are possible. And then the other possibility is, well, maybe this is just an artifact. Maybe it's an artifact of the assay or the collection process. And I'll show you a little bit more data on this. First, I'm going to go back to these virologic factors. So one thing that's been proposed, and again, these are really elegant slides from Dr. Spock, so thank you. One thing that's been proposed is maybe these low blips or residual viral loads or low level viral loads are simply virus being spit out of latently infected cells. So we know that HIV virus lives in, for a long time, in resting memory T cells, and this is, has been called the latent reservoir. These latent T cells have a half-life of almost four years. They can last for almost the life of the patient, and there is evidence that for some not well-described reason, intermittent immune activation can lead to simply virus being spit out of these cells. And that may be responsible for blips that are seen, and there is postulation that it may contribute to low-level viral loads. Most of the data would suggest that this virus being spit out is not replication competent, and it may not be clinically significant. However, I did see conflicting data on that topic as well. The flip side is maybe these low-level viral loads do represent persistent HIV replication at sanctuary sites and maybe we just don't know those sanctuary sites and don't have the commercial assays available to sample them. So those are two theories related to virologic factors that could contribute to low-level viremia. And then turning back to these assay factors or collection factors, here are three studies and there are more that suggest that the use of plasma preparation tubes in collecting the viral load may lead to low-level viral loads simply as an artifact of the assay. For example, if you look at this study, they found that using plasma preparation tubes for collection and storage of plasma resulted in factitious low-level viral loads, which also incurred unnecessary clinic visits, laboratory testing, and medication changes. This study down here from Colleen Kraft and colleagues looked at four different methods of collecting the viral load and looked at rates of low-level viremia with the collection process. And the notable feature is that this second process here, using plasma preparation tubes 
transporting it to the lab, pouring it off, and not doing an extra spin, about a third of these cases had low-level viral loads. And that's thought to simply be from fragmentation of PBMCs, spillage of DNA, and you're just picking that up on the RNA assay. This was reported by a very large medical center just this past fall at ID Week. They had a rash of low-level viral loads, and all, it all ended up being the collection process. So I do think one possibility is simply that we're picking up artifactual DNA from fragmentation of PBMCs related to how the viral load is being collected. So that's a consideration. So let's turn then to some thoughts for management. And again, I will say, I think there are more questions and answers on this topic. First, what do the guidelines say? So from the HHS guidelines, they say, first, there is no consensus, not very helpful. And again, this is really focusing on viral loads between the limit of detection of your assay and 200. They do recommend, and I think this makes sense, assessing adherence, drug-drug interactions, including over-the-counter medications and supplements, and drug food requirements. And then they simply recommend following the viral load at least every three months to assess the need for a change. I thought it was interesting that this is a strong recommendation, though weak evidence obviously. I, I'm going to add a couple of other considerations. I will throw out that a lot of this is based simply on opinion and not great data, but these are the things I would think about if you have someone with persistent low-level viremia or if you're seeing a lot of low-level viremia cases in your clinic. So first, on the individual level, I would absolutely assess adherence. I would call the pharmacy and get a refill history. I like asking the person to come in, show you exactly how they're taking their medications. This has led me to a couple surprises in the past. People who were dissolving meds that shouldn't be dissolved or crushing meds or blending meds that shouldn't be blended. I like to ask the person to bring them in and say, okay, exactly how are you taking this? I think that can be helpful. Absolutely assessing drug interactions, which should include over-the-counters with the integrase inhibitors, things like cations, absolutely acid blockers with drugs like ropivirine or atazanavir food requirements, especially with drugs like ropivirine. Absorption, I think you can consider checking drug level as an assessment of absorption and also of adherence. And Bob Leffelbein gave a great talk on ARV drug levels that's available on our website. This is the new option that Steve Johnson talked about at a recent didactic about checking a DNA genotype. This is gonna come up in one of our cases today. I think jury's really out on the efficacy of those, especially with low level viremia. And I think we need more data, but it is now an option. The sensitivity and specificity are not perfect as we have discussed. Here's something that I will add, which I think is largely based on opinion, but I think that if someone has low-level viremia on a regimen that has a low barrier to resistance, whether that's a triplo or complera or raltegravir or stribild, personally, I would change to a regimen of, with high barrier to resistance, simply given some data that these folks with low-level viremia might have higher risk of virologic failure in the future. Personally, I would make that change. I found one study from Thailand suggesting that that may have some utility and improve outcomes. I found another study showing it did not change outcomes at all. So I think that is largely based on opinion. The other, for the reasons I've showed you, I think that if you're seeing a lot of low-level viremia in your clinic, it's probably worth reviewing the lab collection process and just making sure that they're not doing that second algorithm I showed you with the plasma preparation tubes and no additional spin-off. And then the other thing that we have done, which is not commercially available, is we have sent samples to a research lab for more sophisticated testing to look for evidence of spillage of DNA into the plasma. This is not going to be routinely available. When we've done this locally, even for echo cases, what we've seen is often a mix that there is some spillage of DNA, but there also is some evidence of replication. So this isn't something that is going to be routinely or commercially available, but is a consideration if you have a case that is just really causing headaches. So to wrap up, here's my summary. A lot of this is my take. I'd be curious to hear yours. Low-level viremia can be the result of multiple factors, including behavioral, virologic, or collection factors. I think it's very hard often to identify the exact cause in an individual, and I think the jury is out on the clinical significance. It's possible, though not confirmed, that persistent low-level viremia portends a higher risk of virologic failure in the future in clinical events. I think it definitely makes sense for persistent low-level viremia to assess adherence, drug-drug interactions, behavioral factors, and to monitor the HIV RNA closely. If it's feasible, other considerations would be to review the lab collection process, maybe do a DNA genotype, understanding the limitations of those assays, and then 
personally, I would consider changing a regimen with a low barrier to resistance to a regimen with a high barrier. And finally, I found this really nice clinical review from 2014. And if you want more on this topic, I would highly suggest this. It's very well written. And with that, I will close. I uh, would love to hear your questions or comments and your thoughts on low level varemia. Maybe thoughts from Dr. Spock, Dr. Harrington on how significant these are and what you do in your clinic. Maybe we can just start with questions or comments from those in the ECHO family. Anyone around the community, questions or comments?